And I believe that it all boils down to they want to enjoy their job and have fun doing it. And in some way along somewhere along the way, they want to have a huge payout, um, either through an IPO or an acquisition or uh, comfortable profit streams for many years. So uh, we think we're going to work hard now, enjoy, it, have fun along the way, and then get a big payout. And as long as everyone feels like they're being treated fairly in the organization, um, it will stay fun. And fairly means a not a lot of things. It means that your contributions are valued. It means that you're listened to. It means that you're um, allowed to participate in the creation of the company. And it means that you are compensated in a way that's fair uh, relative to other players. So if one person is unfairly compensated over another, um, the other person feels less like the company's less fun. And that's a big problem because when companies start being fun, people start losing interest and they start departing and leaving and the companies ultimately uh, will fail. And we know a lot of startup companies actually do fail, which is one of the biggest risks about joining a startup. But the perfectly fair equity calculation would be that your share, the percentage that you should own, should equal the value that you bring to the table, the value of your contribution, divided by the total value of the firm. And this will create a perfectly fair equity split. The problem with this particular equation is that it's impossible to determine the total value of the firm and it's impossible to determine the total value of your contribution. Um, in most cases, uh, the firm is worth zero and you can't divide by zero, which creates an even bigger problem. But we try to predict this. We do financial modeling and revenue predictions and we look at you know, comparables in the marketplace. We try to figure out what the firm is going to be worth and we try to think about what the person is going to contribute, but it's extremely difficult. It's, a, it's a, actually it's a completely impossible. So, for instance, today you're seeing a, a a webinar on slicing pie. What's the value of slicing pie? It's impossible to determine. If the, if the Facebook founders had used slicing pie, they could have saved literally millions and millions of dollars in legal fees and settlements. But that doesn't mean that this is a, this is a million dollar presentation today. It may not come into play at all for you. So. It's impossible to determine the value in advance of the value being realized. So this calculation, although it is a perfectly fair equ equation, it's impossible to calculate. So what we need to do, are we need to find some uh, values that we can observe um, and use those as proxies for these values. And I'll show you exactly how that works in a minute. In most cases, founders do what's called a fixed equity split. They dole out chunks of equity to the participants in their uh, company in anticipation of them providing uh, services or, or, or goods or services to their company. So a fixed equity split um, is very common and it's done usually at the outset of the venture. People sometimes refer to the equity split as the first deal that people do. So you, you do deals with customers, you do deals with partners and vendors and investors and all kinds of people in a company's life cycle, but the first deal is you sit down with your co-founders and you determine what your equity split should be. And people think about, you know, whose idea was it, you know, who's putting more time in, who ha who's has more experience. They, 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 they take a lot of things into consideration and they try to split up the pie on day one. Sixty-seven percent of companies actually do this at the outset of the venture. So the fixed equity split would be something like 50-50 or 60-40 or 80-20 or maybe uh, there's four people in the team and you just get 25 percent. In fact, 90 percent of startups do equal splits. They say, you know, we're, we're good friends, we're starting out, we're, this is going to be great, we're going to do a lot of hard work, we'll just do equal splits. <coughs> and that creates a number of problems for startups that we'll talk about in a minute. Because what happens in startups is things change. No matter what you thought was going to happen in the beginning, things inevitably change. The only thing that does not change about a startup company is the fact that it's always changing. So what if you want to quit? Or what if the other guy wants to quit? Or what if uh, you want to bring in a third person? I was with a startup company once where I was the marketing guy and the other Mike, guy was a developer. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. My, I'm not seeing the slides as you're switching them. We are still stuck on the very first one. That's a problem. Let's go back to the old sharing screen here. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Hang on a second. Sharing screens. Looking at my other screen, and now can you see it? We can see it now. No, we right. can see it. All right, so the slides that you missed were this one. Here's the perfectly fair equity calculation, the value of your contribution over the total value. Can you see that one? 
that. And then we talked about fixed equity splits. This is an example of a fixed equity split, and now we're on the changes that companies make. Everyone with me still? Yeah, we are good. We are good. All right. So there are millions of things that can change in a startup company. I was went to the startup. I was mentioning that uh, I had 25% uh, uh, of the equity, and I was the, the marketing person, and there was a developer who had 75% of the equity, and I wanted to bring in some marketing help. And he said, that's great, but you've got to give him equity out of your piece, not my piece, because he's not helping me. I'm still doing the same amount of work. You're doing less work, potentially. So I, had, I got less and less equity going forward, even though I was doing more and more work, and that didn't seem right to me, and ultimately that company went out of business. So there are lots of things that can change. And when you do a fixed equity split, no matter what your intention was and your best intentions, no matter how thoughtful you were about planning your fixed equity split, the second something changes in your organization, something, it's going to be wrong. And that's why fixed equity splits are extremely dangerous. Now, they're extremely common. Most people do them but they're extremely dangerous in their ability to actually deliver what, uh, what they promised to deliver. And so one of these things will be true when something changes. The first one is the value of your contribution, your share will be less than the value of your contribution or greater than the value of your contribution. This is the greater than. That means you have more than your fair share. And early founders typically are in this position. They, 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 they're so scared of giving equity away, they keep more than their fair share. They keep more than what they actually should have. Uh, most people... Um, don't want to have more than their fair share. Sometimes people want to have more than their fair share. They figure if things aren't going to go well, they'll at least have more than their fair share. The second scenario is you'll have less than your fair share. This means you have less than you actually deserve, so the value, less than the value of your contribution divided by the total value. In either of these scenarios, we have a situation where uh, animosity will form in the group, the founding team won't get along as well, and there's potential for major founder conflict. We want to avoid that at all costs. I call these alligator pit negotiations. An alligator pit, there's less than alligators, which are, which are people who are going to come in with, more, with less equity than they deserve. And there are greater than alligators, people who are going to have more equity than they deserve. So when we approach an alligator pit in real life, we do so with fear and self-preservation in mind. And we, we're, we're suspicious of our competition and our, our counterparties. So those are the kind of emotions that we want to bring to the table when we're talking to our co-founders. We want to work in a spirit of cooperation and fairness and know that everyone has each other's interests in mind and know that everyone's getting treated the same way. So we got to get rid of these types of negotiations. When we're negotiating against our founders, our, co our partners, and our employees, we're setting ourselves up for the potential for failure. So we want to avoid that. So alligator pit negotiations are what we want to avoid. Because if it's not fair, it will not be fun, and if it's not fun, people don't want to work there, morale will suffer, and companies ultimately will uh, suffer because of it. <clears throat> so what we need in order to solve this problem is a system that's perfectly fair. We want to reward participants for contributions that they actually make. Fixed equity splits at the outset of a venture give equity in anticipation of something being provided. We, we want to give, uh, act, we reward people for actual contributions. We want to provide ongoing motivation to continue contributing. You know, once you get your equity split, you may or may not want to con continue. Giving a fixed equity split is similar to giving your entire annual salary on day one of your job. Once you got your money, your motivation may, ch may, may dip a little bit. We want to accommodate additions or subtractions to the team so people will join the team or leave the team. We want to make sure that we can easily handle that. We want to be flexible in the face of rapid change because things are going to change very quickly. And we want to get rid of those alligator pit negotiations so we can always get along and know that our, our partners and, uh, have our best interest in mind and we're all aligned properly. <clears throat> so the solution is what's called a dynamic equity split. And dynamic equity splits have been around for a, a long time and there's research shown that dynamic equity splits are indeed the solution for this problem. The problem is they're very difficult to implement. So what I'm going to talk about today is a practical structure for implementing a dynamic equity split. And if you implement it, you'll get all the benefits that I just talked about. <clears throat> so if you contribute 50% of the contributions to that company, you should get 50% of the proceeds, either the equity or profit interest from the company. And a profit interest is uh, rights to the distributions of profits or the proceeds from a sale if the company is sold. Equity interest is similar, except that it also uh, implies legal ownership and control issues, which uh, may or may not be important to your firm. But if you contribute 23.2% of what it takes to get to where you want to go, you should get 23.2% uh, 
of the uh, benefits, no more and no less. You all want everyone, to, you want everyone to have exactly what they deserve. If it's fair, it'll be fun. So the model I describe in my book, Slicing Pie, is called a grunt fund. And uh, grunts are people who do the hard work of starting a startup company. Uh, and there's two pieces to the model. The first is called an allocation framework. It is a set of rules that determines how equity should be doled out to participants on an ongoing basis. It's dynamic, meaning that it changes over time to make sure it's always fair no matter what changes. The second piece is called the recovery framework. The recovery framework determines how when someone separates from the company, either through termination or resignation, that you can recover uh, equity so you don't have an absentee owner. An absentee owner is someone who does not work for your company but still owns a piece of equity. And, and it, as a general rule, you want to avoid that. Most uh, uh, professional investors want to avoid that. So when you go to raise real money, uh, you want to limit your number of ab absentee owners. But I'll tell you about the allocation framework first and then the recovery framework. So the first thing you do is you create a proxy value. Remember, we can't determine actual value, so we have to have something to substitute. So I use this proxy value called slices. And slices represent risk taken by individuals. Risk in a startup, equity represents risk that you'll in a startup, and the, the risk is very specific. It's specific to what you would have otherwise been paid by somebody else. So if I'm a marketing executive, and I know that I can earn $100,000 a year salary on the open market by, by a company who's willing to pay me, then I'm worth $100,000. If I don't get paid $100,000, I'm therefore risking that amount of money if I'm doing the same work for the same type of company. So slices are a measure of risk, and I'll show you how we calculate that. But they provide a proxy value, a substitute value to actual value. So your share should equal the proxy value of your contribution, which will be expressed in slices, over the total proxy value. And it'll adjust over time to keep it, keep it fair. So what I mean by that is we're going to calculate uh, the number of slices that properly reflects the risk you're taking to start the company divided by the slices that everybody contributes, all the risk taken. So your slices you contribute divided by the slices everyone contributes is your, ultimately your share. And this will give us a perfectly uh, precise way to measure the equity uh, for our company. So I'm going to take you through how to determine slices. <clears throat> Everything can convert to slices. There's two types of contributions, two types of things you can put at risk. There are non-cash contributions, things like time, which is the number one thing people contribute to startup companies, ideas, uh, facilities like office space or warehouse space, relationships that turn into investors or sales, uh, sales or revenue and, and for partnerships, and there are cash contributions, which is things that require cash out of pocket. Uh, some things are sort of in between, like equipment and loans and things like that, or, or it could be a cash contribution, could be a non-cash contribution. It's important to note that cash is much harder to come by for most people than non-cash contributions. It's much easier to come up with an idea than it is to save a million dollars. It's much easier to work an hour uh, at $100 an hour than it is to save $100. So cash deserves a higher premium or a higher reward for contributions because cash ultimately is king. We want to attract cash to our company. So in order to determine slices, we take the fair market value of the contribution. If it's a non-cash contribution, we, divide it, we multiply it by two. If it's a cash contribution, we multiply it by four. This reflects the fact that cash is much harder to come by than non-cash. These multipliers are essentially providing an interest rate, a very high interest rate, for taking the extreme amount of risk that you're taking when you put it into a startup company. We all know that the failure rate of a startup company is upwards of 90%. So you're virtually guaranteed to never get paid. It's an extremely high risk investment. So as a reward for taking that risk, we put a premium on your money at 2x for non-cash contributions and 4x for cash contributions. So not only do these multipliers provide extra incentive to make to take the risk, they also provide protection on the back end in the recovery framework, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but these are very critical pieces of the model because they create penalties for people making decisions that adversely affect the other party, and I'll show you that in a minute. So let me show you some examples. So the the slice, to convert slices, uh, time into slices, you, you take the fair market salary, which is what I could be earning on the open market if a company is willing to pay me. In fact, most of us that have had real jobs um, 
work for no equity whatsoever. So whatever we're being paid is the, is the amount that we're perfectly happy getting paid. That's our fair market rate. If you're not getting paid your fair market rate, you're, that's being put at risk. However, if you're being paid anything at all, whatever you are being paid is being taken off the table. So we subtract cash compensation. And we multiply it by 2 to de determine the number of slices. And we divide by 2,000 to create, create an hourly rate because 2,000 is roughly the number of hours in a year. And that gives us our grunt hourly resource rate, or GER, which is the slices per hour. So let me show you an example of how that works. If you're the kind of person who is doing a job that's worth about 10,000 euros on the open market and the startup company is paying you 2,500 euros, then only 7,500 euros is put at risk. That's the risk portion that you're contrib contributing. You multiply by 2, that gives you 15,000. You divide by 2,000, that gives you a grunt hourly resource rate of 7.5 slices per hour. So every hour you work will earn you 7.5 slice, slices per hour in the pie or you will be contributing 7.5 slices to the pie. And this should encapsulate your experience, your skills, your expertise, your great ideas. Whatever your open market rate salary is a reflection of your abilities. So you're being properly compensated at that rate for the abilities you bring to the table. Small amounts of money, working capital that the company needs to, to buy things that it can't get for equity. Um, is the cash amount times four. So whatever is invested or spent on the company is multiplied by four. So if a cash investment is made into the company, it's not converted to four until it's actually spent. Or if you have an unreimbursed expense, for instance, it's times four. The fair market value of equipment, if it's new, it's treated as a cash, if you purchase it on behalf of the company, it's treated as an unreimbursed expense. The fair market value, if it's less than a year old, is an, it's considered a non-cash contribution because you didn't have cash out of pocket. So you treat the fair market value at the purchase price. If it's older than a year old, you treat it at the book value, which you could look up on eBay. So everything can be converted into a fair market value. The fair market value of a new product is a cash value. If it's a used product, it's a non-cash contribution. Everything can be converted to slices. So uh, relationships are something that people bring to the table and very important. Typically, if you're a salesperson uh, and you have great relationships, the way you make money in the open market on your relationships is through a commission on sales. So you can earn a commission in a startup company. If the company does not pay that out, it's treated as a non-cash contribution of unpaid commission times two. Ideas are another huge contribution that companies make. The typical way to reward an idea in the, fair, in the open market is through a royalty. So if I um, am a book author and I write a great book and it sells, the publisher will pay me a royalty to reflect my ownership of that idea. If I'm a rock star and I write a great song, the, the record company will pay me a royalty. If I'm an inventor and I invent a new fishing tackle box, the fishing tackle box manufacturer will pay me a royalty on revenues generated from that idea. So the proper way to reward an idea is through the is uh, on a royalty on revenues. If your idea never generates any revenues, then there's no reason to give you a reward for it because it wasn't a very good idea. So the best way to tell if a business idea is a good idea is to uh, see if it generates revenues. And, and by providing a royalty, you can, you can reward the person for coming up, coming up with that idea. If you buy supplies or equipment for your company, it's treated as an unreimbursed expense, which is a cash out of pocket, so it's times four. I have a list of these things um, in Slicing Pie and on my website, and uh, there's a calculation for every possible kind of input that will take the fair market value and multiply it by the proper multiplier. So let me show you how this works in practice. So here we, here's, here's our company. We have our junior developer, we have the founder, and we have the rich uncle. The rich uncle put up a lot of cash to get this company started, and they spent a lot of money on development. The, I, the, the founder had the idea and put some equipment in, the junior developer is, is putting uh, some time in on the marketing website. He's just right out of college. So all you do is you, take, you convert the contributions. This person put time. This is time and ideas. This is money and relationships. You put them, uh, you add them all together to, this, to create a total slices. And you divide each person's sh individual share by the total. So grunt number one, two, and three. It gives us a pie like this. Now it's logical that the junior developer would not have as big a slice as the rich uncle who put all the money up. It's logical that the founder would have a bigger chunk than the grunt than the, than the junior developer. So this has provided a perfectly fair split among the founders of this company that re properly reflects the contributions they've made and the risk that they're taking. 
Now, let's say we want to add another guy. So this is a salesperson, and he's going to provide some, spend some time and make some good sales. So all we do is take with the slices that he's created, that he's contributing, and add them into the total. Now, assuming nobody else did any work that particular period, um, we just simply redivide everyone's uh, contribution by the total. So here's number one, two, and three. And here's number four, the new guy. So now the pie is re reallocated a little bit. Grunt number four is in here. He has a chunk of equity because he brought some sales and the company's moving forward. This is a good thing. Grunt number three has a slightly smaller percentage, but he's happier because the company's moving forward and growing. So again, we've been able to add somebody fluidly to the, to the model without uh, having to negotiate fixed equity splits. They, uh, they automatically know exactly, exactly what they deserve. Get a little feedback out there. Has something changed? No, no. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm getting a little feedback on my voice and making it hard to talk. There, that's that's much better. So the next thing I want to talk about is the recovery framework. When someone leaves a company, that creates a problem. Um, it creates an absentee owner, which is not necessarily a desirable thing. It also creates a problem of what, do they get to keep their equity and under what circumstances. So there are four conditions under which someone can leave a company. The first one is they can be fired for good reason. Being fired for good reason implies that they uh, did something that was incompatible with the values of the company. So maybe they brought a gun to work, or maybe they sexually harassed a coworker, or maybe they were stealing from the company or lying to people. Uh, those are good reasons to fire someone. The most common good reason to fire someone is a performance-related issue if they're not doing their job. In order to fire someone for good reason for performance-related issues, you have to give them at least two warnings. So they're not doing their job, you've got to give them a warning, and then another warning, and then you can fire them. If you don't give them a warning, it's not fair. You have to give people with performance-related issues the opportunity to correct their behavior. But if they don't correct their behavior, they can be fired for good reason. So in this case, the employee has made decisions about how they're going to act and behave that have negatively impacted the future of the company. <clears throat> the second reason you can, be let, you can be removed is you can be fired for no good reason. This is letting someone to go with no, with, without the warning. Maybe they weren't performing, but you, you don't like them anymore. Maybe they, you just didn't need them anymore. Or maybe um, you just want to shrink the company. For whatever reason the, the company makes to fire someone, you can fire someone for whatever reason you want. However, if the, this is a situation where the company has made decisions that negatively impact the future of that employee. The next reason someone can resign for good reason. This is another case where the company has made decisions that negatively impact the employee. So if the company managers make a decision to change your job description or change your title or change your compensation that doesn't affect anybody else or move the company to uh, Seattle, Washington and expect everyone to move with them, those are all good reasons to move. In that case, the company has made decisions that negatively impact the future of the employee. And the last case is resigned for no good reason. Maybe the person just want, didn't want to work there anymore. Maybe they got a better job somewhere else that paid higher. Or maybe they couldn't afford to work for no money anymore. Whatever their own personal reasons are, that's resignation with no good reason. This is a situation where the individual has made a decision that negatively impacts the employee. So, case, so A and D are situations where the, where the individual is negatively impacting the future of the company, so we need to protect the company. In the other situation, uh, the company has made decisions that negatively impact the future of the employee, so we need to protect the employee. So here's how it plays out. If you're fired for good reason or you resign for no good reason, you're making decisions that negatively impact the future of the company, and you should be penalized for that. It should hurt to, to make that decision. You, don't, you want to provide a disincentive for people to make those kinds of decisions. So what happens is you remove your pie for non-cash contributions. You just lose that. It goes away. Cash equivalents are adjusted down to their dollar amounts or their cash amounts without the multipliers. So if I put $1,000 in, the company can buy you back for $1,000 if they have the money. They don't have to buy you back, but when they get the money they can, they can, and can afford to pay you back, they can buy you out. And you should be asked to sign a non-compete. You, you can't quit your job and then compete with the company. That's not fair. So it's painful when employees make decisions that negatively impact the future of the company. On the flip side, if you're fired for no good reason or you, or you resign for good reason, then you are making decisions, the company is making decisions that negatively impact your future. So in this case, you get to keep your equity. 
if the company wants to buy it back, you can offer to sell it back at the full proxy value, including the multipliers. That means if you put $1,000 in, the company's got to pay you $4,000 to get you out. That's painful for the company. They don't want an absentee owner, and it's very expensive to buy somebody out, as it should be. We want to protect employees from employers making quick decisions that negatively impact their future. We want the company to think twice before they make decisions that negatively impact an individual. Additionally, we cannot ask someone to sign a non-compete uh, agreement because it's not fair to fire somebody for no reason or push them out of the company and then expect them not to compete. It doesn't mean the, the individual can't steal ideas. It just means they, can, uh, they, they can't compete in the same industry. So in this case, the, in the recovery framework, we've created penalties that protect one party against another. So let me show you an example of how that works. So here's our team again. Let's give this guy this grunt number one a warning. You're not doing your job, grunt. You got to get to work. Give him one warning. Give him two warning. Third time, he's fired. He wasn't doing his job. He made decisions that negatively impacted the future of the company. So all you do is subtract the pieces that he the, he just put non-cash contributions in. So you subtract those from the base from the base value, and you recalculate everyone's share. So there's grunt number two, three, and four. So now the pie has readjusted. Now grunt number three has a little bit more. These guys have a little bit more, but they're not necessarily better off because now they got to go find a new developer. But the pie has properly adjusted to reflect what's fair. So everyone has exactly what they deserve. So what we've created is a perfectly fair system. We're always getting exactly what we deserve relative to other people. We're rewarding participants for the actual contributions they make, not what we think they're going to make, but the actual contributions they actually make. We're providing ongoing motivation to continue contributing. So when that grunt number three, uh, one got fired, we, he, he no longer was contributing, so he no longer earned slices. We're accommodating additions and subtractions to the team, so we added a salesperson, we took away a developer, and the, the model handled it very easily. It's flexible in the face of rapid change. It doesn't create a lot of paperwork, or we can just add people and subtract people as we need to because the rules are all there. And we've gotten rid of the gators. No one ever has to worry that they're going to go into a negotiation where they might come out with more or less than they deserve. Now eventually, you're going to outgrow the use of a grunt fund. This is best for bootstrap startups without a lot of cash. When you can just pay people for what they provide, you don't have to use equity. Paying people is the best way to start a company. If you don't have cash, you've got to use equity. So if you're generating real revenues and positive cash flow, you can use part of that money or all of that money to pay people for their contributions instead of giving them equity. Or if you get a Series A investment from a major investor, uh, you can use that money to pay people. Series A investment implies, in my world, that you have enough money to pay people instead of using equity. And what's nice about this is you no longer have to worry about going into an alligator pit negotiation. Um, there's a couple of resources that I want to bring your attention to. Uh, there's a Get Them Gators, which is a short guide on how equity splits work like this to help uh, convince partners and employees. Slicing Pie, of course, is a book about this topic. And I'm working on another book called the Pie Slicer Handbook, which, um, which I'm actually changing a little bit going forward. But uh, it's a it's a guide that accompanies a piece of online software that I have. Um, there's a spreadsheet you can download off the website that help you will help you keep track of everything that people input. And there's software that will help you track your team. People can add their contributions on their own. My mission in life is to make sure that every entrepreneur in the world gets exactly what they deserve from their company, no more and no less. And so I'm trying to provide as many resources as possible to make sure people can apply this model. I'm trying to do it. Uh, uh, so any questions you have, of course, you can contact me through my website. I'm happy to help as much as I can. There's uh, lawyers out there that are what I call slicing pie friendly. There's uh, legal templates. There's videos and articles that help you uh, apply the model to your own situation. This is a universal model for determining fairness in a financial transaction. There is a solution for whatever your company is, th th this will work. So I, I want to make sure I make myself available as much as I can to help you out. Um, and that's the end. So if you want to download a copy of these slides, go to slicingpie.com slash Africa, and you can download a copy of the slides uh, and the book. I'd be happy to take some questions if you guys have any. You know, I, I appreciate you guys uh, holding your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, that was a good presentation. I think we'll take the questions from the attendees. Okay. So, uh, since you are using uh, one laptop, I think the, they will have to come forward and ask so that you, uh, they will be audible. Okay. So, if you have any questions, you can introduce yourself. Uh, hi, Hi, Mike. Hello, how are you? I'm very fine. My name is Samuel. Hello, Samuel. Yeah, and I'm running a startup called Chura. 
So I wanted to know what are your thoughts on vesting? Vesting schedules. Vesting schedules? Yeah. So vesting schedules are a tool for traditional equity splits that protect people from the chance that the people they hire won't work out. Um, so you don't need a vesting schedule in a grunt fund because the recovery framework provides protection that you'll need in order to get the equity back in the event that someone doesn't work out or gets fired for no reason. Um, so you don't need a vesting schedule uh, for this kind of program. Uh, you just you just allocate or, re or recover. So a vesting schedule is to prevent equity from going to someone who doesn't deserve it and it's by doling it out over time. That being said, in some legal jurisdictions, in some legal situations, I'm not sure the local laws are for you, at least in the United States, under certain cer corporate structures, there's a structure in the United States called a C Corp, um, which, uh, in which case the grunt fund would act as the vesting schedule. So instead of a time-based vesting schedule, um, this, the grunt fund is the vesting schedule, so it determines the number of shares that vest after each period. Um, so the answer is you don't need a vesting schedule with a grunt fund because the recovery framework protects the company from mistakes that are made and also protects the individual in the same way the vesting schedules do, or the grunt fund is the vesting schedule. I can't hear you if you're talking to me. By the look of it, uh, it seems like uh, no more questions. No more questions, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, you can say hi to the guys. So. This is a lot to take in. There's a lot of information here. What I hope you will learn today is the basics of how this works, and I hope that I've piqued your interest enough to want to explore this topic further. If you're using a fixed equity split in your company today, there's a very good chance that you're gonna, it's going to backfire later on. You're going to run into some conflict, or you may be already experiencing that conflict. Um, I, ex I really encourage you to take a, a, a closer look at how this model works, because I know that it will solve your problems for equity splits and make sure that everyone has what you're, you deserve to have. If you're using a fixed equity split, um, your chances are you're not getting what you deserve to have. You're either having more or too, or too much or too little. In either, either case, you're creating stress among your founding team. I appreciate you watching this morning, and please feel free to contact me through slicingpie.com. All right. So, um, that's it. Yes, a word from uh, Eliza. Well, I guess I will visit you sometime soon. I'm back in Nairobi right now. I arrived today. I plan to come by during the week after next. So this coming week, I'm going to be in Cape Town. Uh, but once I'm back, I will come to your tech hub and see what uh, your startups are working on. Mike, thanks so much for doing this. We know that we had a sold out event, uh, so a lot of people missed the opportunity to actually attend. But it's great that we've managed to do this remotely as well. So what country for... are you guys in? Uh, we're in Kenya. You're in Kenya? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm drinking Kenya. I have Kenyan coffee right here that I bought on my trip last week, so. <laughs> Beat. Delicious. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. It was nice to meeting you. I hope I can meet you in person someday. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I hope we'll keep the conversation going and see if we can get the package so that we can experience you. Great. Thank you, guys. Okay. Bye. All right. Great day.